welcome to Traceability TV News, your source for the latest updates on global traceability and safety concerns. I'm your host, Miriam Munyoki. On to the headlines. New social health insurance scheme begins July 1st in Kenya. Kenya secures 485 million US dollars loan from South Korea. Mexico elects first female president. Modi named to lead India for a third term. Kenyan runner Ronex Kipruto banned for doping. Uganda secures historic first win at T20 World Cup. Starting July 1st, Kenyans will contribute 2.75% of their gross salary to the new Social Health Insurance Fund. As announced by Health Cabinet Secretary Susan Kuchima, the new scheme under the Social Health Authority replaces the National Health Insurance Fund. CS Nakumicha has emphasized that the contributions will make healthcare more affordable. Registration for the scheme must be completed by June 30th and can be done via mobile phone, community health promoters, or healthcare facilities. Additionally, a critical illness emergency fund will provide support for those with chronic illnesses such as cancer, diabetes, and hypertension. Kenya has secured a $485 million consensual loan from South Korea. This includes $238 million for the Konza Digital Media City project, aimed at boosting Kenya's digital ecosystem and youth opportunities in the creative economy. President Ruto held talks with the South Korean president at the Korea-Africa Summit, reviewing the 132 billion Kenya shilling partnership from Ruto's previous visit in November 2022. Discussions focused on trade, industrialization, infrastructure and job creation, alongside agriculture, climate change and carbon-free energy transitions. In a historic victory, Claudia Sheinbaum has become Mexico's first female president, winning the 2024 general elections. At 61, Claudia, who served as Mexico's city mayor from 2018 to 2023, also marks another milestone as the first Jewish person to hold the presidency in Mexico. Jane Baum, a feminist and former energy scientist, pledged to continue the work of her predecessor and mentor, Manuel Lopez. She will officially take office on October 1st. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will lead the National Democratic Alliance government for a third term after securing a slim majority in recent elections. Modi's party won 240 seats down from 303 in 2019, requiring support from regional allies. Despite the reduced majority, Modi was unanimously chosen by the NDA. However, the opposition India coalition, which won 232 seats, has not conceded and plans to continue its opposition. Modi's new government faces challenges in pushing reforms due to reliance on smaller parties. This election saw record participation with over 600 million voters. Hello and welcome to Visibility Sports News. I'm Regan Gitao. Ronex Kipruto, 24, has been banned for six years for doping. The ban follows irregularities in his athlete biological passport, suggesting blood manipulation. Kipruto, who set the 10 km road race world record in 2020 and won bronze in the 10,000 meters at the 2019 World Championships, will see his titles annulled. Despite denying the charges, the tribunal found Kipruto engaged in a deliberate and sophisticated doping regime. He spanned until May 2029 and may appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sports. Brian Masaba's Uganda clinched their first T20 World Cup victory in a thrilling low scoring match against Papua New Guinea. Uganda bowled PNG out for 77 but faced challenges chasing the target losing five wickets for 26 runs by the seventh over. Celebrating their victory, the Ugandan team danced on the field and bowed to fans who traveled from Africa. Uganda having qualified over Zimbabwe marked their success with a spirited celebration, acknowledging the hard work and dedication that led to this momentous win. That wraps up our sport news for today. I'm your host, Rikan Gitao. Stay tuned for an informative interview on traceability with the CEO of GS1 Kenya.
Hello and welcome back to Trace Talk, your go-to segment on Traceability TV that dives deep into the world of traceability and the leaders that are making it all happen. As always, I'm your host, Marianne Munyoki, and today I have a very special guest with me. He's a visionary leader and the mind behind GS1 Kenya. Today we are tracing the path of the CEO of GS1 Kenya, Mr. Peter Otieno. He'll be sharing some incredible insights on traceability and the exciting future of GS1 Kenya. So sit back, enjoy, and prepare for an engaging conversation that connects all the dots of traceability. Thank you so much for joining us today. And can you please state your name and what you do and how you do it for the people at home? Thank you very much, Miriam. My name is Peter Otieno. I'm the CEO for GS1 Kenya. And we are here to help uh, our members track and trace their products. Thank you so much. So I'll dive straight into it. And first of all, can you tell us about your journey to becoming the CEO of GS1 Kenya? So it's been long. It's been long and actually it was not planned for, for me to be the CEO. But it all began by us as a, where I used to be employed in the corporate world. Uh, we face some challenges in how to track our products and also make, get our products into the supermarket. So a group of us, quite a, quite a number of them have left. We began on the journey on how to backcode Kenya. Mm -hmm. This is way back in 1998. So come 1999, uh, this team formed an organization known as East African European Article Numbering, oh. popularly known as EAN. And the barcodes were introduced in Kenya as 616. But come 2005, uh, the EAN was not able to, there were few challenges and some difficulties. And of course, the governance then did not make it possible for EAN to succeed. Mm. Uh, then. Uh, Four other people, including me, mm -hmm. uh, two, three other gentlemen, myself, we formed uh, GS1 as a business uh, name. Yeah. Uh, then a year later, uh, in 2006, 2007, we actually formed GS1 to take over from EAN, which had collapsed uh, due to some legal issues. And uh, GS1 since then actually grew in small bits and bounds until we are here now. But I must say it has been a very difficult journey yes. uh, because 2016, uh, the company GS1 was also not doing very well because we didn't have proper governance. And uh, we decided to invite some professionals or consultants, uh, Orion Consulting Firm, who helped us actually to see where we were going. And from then, two years later, the board then actually prevailed upon me to leave what I was doing privately to come and join uh, to lead this organization based that uh, was there in the beginning of uh, this company. Uh, so since 2018, yes. I've been the CEO and we've seen quite a lot transforming from a company dying mm -hmm. to a company which is now flourishing and serving a lot of uh, our members. Wow, okay, yeah? so thank you. And just a follow-up question on what you've just said. So you said that they called you and you came. So what motivated you to leave that, all that behind and come and take over just one. Because my aspiration or my, my, my vision by the time we were beginning mm -hmm. this uh, journey of backcoding Kenya, I, I was doing my own business. Mm -hmm. I was running a, a small cosmetic outlet and it was quite difficult for us to sell our products into the market. Most multinationals were able to actually put the products in the supermarket, but the SMEs were finding it very difficult because to get one back backcode they were paying 150000 So imagine you had 10 products that's 1.5 million down the drain. And th this motivated me actually to, to join this organization. But by seeing that majority of the people on the board did not see the vision of actually how to make it more affordable to small scale uh, business people, I, I, I took the lead to actually try to show. And I realized if I don't go in there and being the founder directors, then definitely whoever we're employing to take up the role as a general manager or as a CEO, most of them did not see what we wanted to do. And for that reason, I felt since this was one of my childhood, well, not really childhood, but my early life as, as, as a businessman that it needed to grow, I thought by running it, I would definitely help more businesses than what I was doing by then. Okay. Yeah. So let's dive into company management because you said that you ha you face some challenges, right? So what key principles have guided you, your approach to company management at GS1 Kenya? This, this is a good question and uh, I've tried to bring it up in one of the books I've written. Yeah. No organization will perform or will succeed 
if he doesn't have a roadmap. And one of the key things for a roadmap is to have a well-functioning governance. If it's a family business, of course, then the, the, the family, the head of the family, become the, the kind of a source of inspiration for the people to be there. Mm -hmm. But in an organization like this, where you have a group of people and different stakeholders, then governance becomes uh, the key. And what do I mean by the governance here? I'm looking at the board, the people who leave whatever they're doing, to steer this company in terms of the policy, in terms of the strategy, in terms of the vision. So this, for me, was the key thing to do. And, and that's the reason why I became part and parcel of the board. Now, another thing is that when the governance is there, the governance should not interfere with the day-to-day -day management of the organization. Because what they do is to create policies, uh, vision, mm -hmm. and the strategy. Then leave this strategy to an executive which is actually capable of... Uh, implementing these strategies and to and follow the vision where the policy makers have done. Now if this is done, then the board must also give guidance to the management in terms of uh, capacity building. You must allow the managers to grow in terms of their own academics, in terms of their own professionalism, and allow them to become innovative in the work they are doing. In that case, the company will grow. Oh, wow. yeah. So you brought up the issue of innovation, not issue, but the aspect of innovation. So how is just one leveraging technology to enhance traceability? That's a good question. For you to understand this, I think then we have to go back 50 years or 50 plus <laughs> years uh, to understand why that this question of innovation becomes a key yeah. aspect of GS1. The barcodes as itself began in 1974 mm -hmm. when the first barcode was, uh, was uh, scanned. Yes. And the reason was most retailers by then were using tags, price tags. Okay. And price tag basically brought two issues. One okay. is that the era of human, uh, where a six can become nine <laughs> and a three can become E. Yeah. Uh, another thing was also what in GS1 we refer to as sweet heartening. Sweet heartening means uh, I'll tell my girlfriend, sorry, not now, <laughs> or I will ask people are my friends, people are close to me, yes. to come to the shop. Make sure you pick this product mm -hmm. and sell it to you at this price. Yeah. And the difference, let's see how best we can share that if it is a profit. Mm -hmm. So if you're selling a product of 100 shillings mm -hmm. at 10 shillings, there's 90 shillings saving. So that 90 shillings saving, you can say, give me 45, you take 45. Okay. That is called sweet heartening. Yeah. Or sweet heartening. Now, this allowed retailers to manage their stocks easily available and knowing how the stocks are being managed mm. or being sold. Yes. But with the time, this is becoming obsolete. Mm. Why? Because the world has become a small village. And uh, I usually say as a young man, uh, I used to do a lot of window shopping <laughs> by walking on, on through the windows. Today, my daughters, my sons, online young people, shopping. they do online shopping. Yes, do. And this is not something which was seen 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for GS1 to, uh, to sustain itself yes. and remain relevant, yes. they must take this into account. Yeah. How are we going to be part and parcel of this new technology? And what do we do or what do we, how do we use the, the, the standards we already have mm -hmm. to implement into this new uh, emerging trends? Mm -hmm. okay. and, and, and this is why the, the, the traceability comes play. Of course, we know we have the, the mechanism of doing it. And therefore, when you put in the, in the new trends, we succeed. Okay, yeah. so I, since this is traceability TV, can you give me and the viewers at home the recent innovations that GS1 Kenya has implemented on traceability? I think we've done well since 2018. Yeah. And, and the first innovation we brought in place is what we call Tamani Online. Yes. And this basically was in, initiated by the suppliers mm -hmm. or manufacturers because around 20, between 2015 to 2019, a lot of major supermarkets were closing down and suppliers were losing a lot. So the supplier asked us, this item we are putting on, our, or rather the codes we are putting on our products, how best can it be used to track and trace our uh, assets mm -hmm. and, you know, and products? Yes. 
And, and this is where we thought deeply and said, fine, is there a way we can actually not really bypass the retailers, but make the supplier and the consumer become the relevant in the supply chain? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, me as a manufacturer, I want to serve the clients and my clients are the consumers, yes. not the retailer. The retailer basically are an open store or a distribution point. So this is the reason why we brought in this innovation where this, the consumer can actually go directly to the supplier. Uh, but the most recent on the same line is what we call Hakikisha mm -hmm. Bida. This is a, a case where we feel not only the consumer can identify the products, more details of that product to the, cons to the supplier, but they, it can have, it, it, they have a platform where they can directly link to the, con to the manufacturer. So you find the supplier can actually talk to the consumer on a real-time basis. Mm -hmm. So that is a way of, we feel we've innovated the way retail is going. Why? Because the youth of today, they shop online. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So what future trends in traceability do you see shaping the industry? You've mentioned online online shopping, but apart from that, can you give us something new? Uh, let me not play <laughs> <laughs> the seer for, for that, but let me try and, and, and say this. Mm -hmm. The world is changing and changing very fast. Yes. As I said earlier, and it's becoming a, sm uh, a small village. Mm -hmm. I, I can buy something from China, yeah. I can buy something from the US, and within 24 hours, 36 hours, it will be here. Yes. Uh, I've not seen this product. I only saw it figuratively online. Okay, yeah. Something that we call a digital twin of the physical products. So when the product arrives, I want to see it as it is, the way they are showing it on the, on, the, on the internet. Now, for this, I believe the future of the world will go whereby, and let me take another line, yes. uh, where I am somewhere in Guatemala, mm -hmm. And I have people who have got interest of a particular product in, in Africa, and for this matter, maybe in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And my, the consumer for that product could be in Japan. Mm -hmm. So the farmer, if I may call it that way, in Guatemala, don't have to come to Kenya. But he has farms in Kenya, and he will actually be farming in Kenya using the technology and the people in Kenya. But the product will not be consumed in Guatemala, neither will it be consumed in Kenya, but it will be consumed in Japan. So there are three, is, is a trapezoid. Yeah. And this, everybody is communicating and saying, okay, by this day, I think I'll get my products, and they'll be coming from this place. But the person selling me this product is coming from this country. And yet, there will be trust. And that actually is what this one is trying to do, to bring trust into the trade. Uh, like any other company, uh, the, the key thing for you to remain relevant is to keep innovating. Yeah. Is to keep innovating and is keep understanding the trend, the new trends which is coming in. 30 years ago, 50 years ago, we didn't care. Uh, I'll, I'll go home, get the food and come and eat. But now I know not only growing that, but I can share it with somebody without our problem. For that reason, we must look at it that uh, just like air is fluid, mm -hmm. the trade should be fluid for it to, start to grow. And that's where GS1 is standing itself. That you know what? We must keep on innovating. We must keep on having new challenges and going over them for us to remain relevant. The, the, the youth of today yes. really wants something which is quite dynamic and something which will make them not to move a lot, but mm -hmm. to, to, to feel as a call or a push of a button, they have what they what want. They need, yeah. But when you push a button and you see something very beautiful mm -hmm. and or nice or lovely, but the moment you're brought to them, you find, oh, this is not what I really wanted. Okay. Uh, this is the reason why GS1 is coming in and saying, you know what, we must create what is called a twin, a digital twin of a physical product. So if I see this water is physical here, if I see it in any other platform, it is exactly, and I will not miss uh, when, when it is brought to me. Okay, yeah. so not to take you back, yes. but you mentioned something about authoring books. <laughs> I've been keeping that in my mind, in the back of my mind. Can you please tell us about your books and which one you're the most proud of? Uh, I, I met a, a, a professor relative of mine, and he's a literature yes. <coughs> professor. And I told him it's quite ironical because when I was young, Literature was the least subject I wanted. Uh, in fact, I had a problem with my literature teacher uh, because it, it was not something I thought I would do. Mm. But out of blues, I realized uh, I've got interest in doing a lot of uh, writing books. 
Uh, at some point I started a blogging, but I stopped because I felt there's too much for me to handle. But of now, I've got uh, two books on the shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is called Harding the Zebra. Uh, this is basically a story of, or a journey on how GS1 came to be. The intricacies of the political uh, behind the scenes, uh, what we did wrong, what we did right, uh, and how the operation grown to be what it is. Mm -hmm. It is, I, will, I won't say it's hilarious, <laughs> but I'll say it has a lot of interesting things of how somebody can start something from nowhere and go to be what it is. So that's how, or what inspired me to write this book called Harding the Zebra. The volume two of it is on the way, and, and I believe we are God willing, in a short period of time, we should have the second volume <laughs> of Harding the Zebra. Uh, this, my second book uh, is actually based on my upbringing on uh, spirituality. It's actually Robbing the God's Gift. Robbing the God's Gift. Uh, and this is, is, I will say it's a very controversial book, because those I've shared with them, they, they, some of them blast me. Why did you write this? Why did you not write that? But it's also inspired by the fact that the way religion has been brought to us is somehow that you do not need to question things which you do not, not understand. But see, the, the mind of a young person is inquisitive. And if they can't get, if they can't get answers, ready answers, then they'll try and explore. And uh, I'm not left alone. I was also in, in that lane. I, I explored a lot when I was growing up. And uh, when the school I went to, I, I'm saying, I'm lucky or fortunate, it was a school mixed of so many. We had Indians, we had whites, we had blacks, we had uh, Arabs. So it was quite an interesting uh, outfit, and especially everybody talking about their religion. But I look back and I say, fine, why are we in this world? And if you start to ask those questions, you realize actually each and every person, including living things, plants and animals, we have four things basically to look at mm -hmm. and that's what I, I explore and then I explore what are the benefits of everything you do because at the end of the day nobody chose to be born nobody said I want to be born you find yourself there <laughs> and when you find yourself there there are a few things you do not understand why they happen or why do you get them or why do you experience them when you when you do when you do a few things so the, the book is talking about that mm -hmm. it is quite an interesting book I, I will recommend anybody to read it mm -hmm. I've, re I've read it more than four times <laughs> since I published it and uh, every time I feel I want to laugh or I want to argue with myself yeah. I, I read it yeah. so that's why it is but I believe uh, in the next two three years there will be two more books coming out oh yeah. can't wait to see that Thank you. <laughs> I, what, I'd like to ask you to give a piece of advice to any aspiring leader out there you know when you were growing up you were told uh, that three or four types of leadership. That those who are born, you are born a leader. Born a leader. Yeah, that those who are uh, trained to be yeah. leaders, that those who just <laughs> grab it, some people say you cannot take power without grabbing it. But leadership, everybody's a leader. <clears throat> everybody's, I believe, is born a leader. Mm -hmm. How to make yourself a leader is what differs. Yeah? Uh, and, and leadership calls for sacrifice. That, that for me, anybody who can sacrifice what they want to do to inspire other people to be great, or somebody who can pick something, doesn't matter whether it's a company or not, any, even in, in sports, even in the meetings you have, and you are there to contribute without fearing what people are going to say. But you remain faithful to what you are saying, you remain true to the people, and remain true to the cause of what you want to do. Two, a leader must have a vision yeah. of what he or she wants to achieve and where he wants to take the people is leading. A leader must also be able to at least pen down a few things. Yeah? But this happens some years back, but I want to do something different. So you, you, you become inquisitive or you, you not really judge, but you interrogate each and everything you see for the benefit of people because it cannot be benefit for yourself then you're not a leader because who will you be leading you must lead a group of people but you must try and take them and the best leader is the one who listens not the one people he wants people to listen to him you listen and maybe speak last after everybody has said what they want to say then you actually say okay this is good for the for the community or this is good for us and i think that will be the, the, for me what kind of a leadership you want to be mm -hmm. take risks 
but calculated risk. Because uh, there's no point of being a leader yeah. and you don't want to jump the board. You, I mean, to go into the deep end. Yeah. You, if you want people to go to the deep end, be the first one and show them what <laughs> be done. Read uh, when you have a, an opportunity. I think a good leader should also try and read different uh, aspect of life, not only on one area you want. It must be almost everything from sports to religion to geopolitics uh, to anything you feel might be of interest to you. Why? That expands your knowledge and to understand where things happen here and there. You must be not so quick mm -hmm. to judge. Mm -hmm. There are always two sides of a story. Mm -hmm. uh, I might not be, that might not be my strength, but I believe that's one of the key pillars of a leader that don't be quick to judge. And two, uh, be patient mm -hmm. and, and understand at your age group. So if you're a leader in your 20s, yes. then of course you understand that there will be people less than <laughs> earlier than younger than you. Yeah. If you're a leader in the 60s, like I am, or the 70s, then you understand that you have even a big gap. Yeah. You have people in, your, in the 50s, in the 40s, 30s, and even now another group altogether would, you might not know. So you might be forced to go back and read about this group and see how best you can actually take them through. Okay. Yeah. Give us a parting shot, say goodbye to the people at home, and tell them to <laughs> subscribe to the Sabinity <laughs> TV. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for that. <clears throat> this would be my parting shot. Anybody who wants to go into trade, or anybody who wants to understand their business well, there's this aspect which we are selling, like traceability. So, what is it? Why are we pushing for this traceability? The world as it is is made of at least gathering of information everybody has acquired or which is happening. And, and, and this, coupled with the, with the fact that now the world has become one village, and of course there are geopolitics playing a key role into this, it would be very interesting for somebody to seek out. And for me, the, I, I look at this point of view, if you are going into trade, do not limit yourself with just within your surrounding. Look out at a bigger sea. The, the best market for you will be outside this country. You can start with this country, you can go to the region, but try to imagine that you can actually sell this thing to the Far East, like the Japan, the North, the northernmost, like the Scandinavians, and the Far West, like the US. All these people need something which we have. And this is where you should look at. If you're going to make roast groundnuts, please do not just roast groundnuts for us here in Nairobi. <laughs> Try to imagine you can roast these groundnuts for somebody in China. And to do this, you need to have a way of convincing the market out there, what, this thing is authentic, it's real, and you can actually track where it has come from. And this is where you'll find our, our, our standards come into play. And this is why I say anybody, and especially farmers, if, if I leave the manufacturing, because our manufacturing skill, though so good or well uh, structured in Africa, mm -hmm. but we are still far behind uh, the, the, the so-called newly industrialized countries. But agriculture, I think for me, this is the biggest opportunity we have. And Kenyan farmers, regardless of where you are, farm knowing that you want to take this product outside our country. Mm -hmm. And that's where money is. That's where money is. And to do this, please come to us, to GS1. We'll definitely give you the standards on how to do it through tracking and tracing. Uh, Marianne, thank you very much for this opportunity to explain to our viewers yes. what we do. And uh, I think it's quite interesting. For our viewers, I, I will definitely encourage you to get more information. Please get in touch with us. We like to hear from you. We like also to publish you out there through using this platform, GS1 Traceability TV. And this is what you're asking me to do. Be part and parcel of Traceability TV. Thank you okay. so much. And okay. that's a wrap on today's episode. We've had an enlightening conversation with the CEO of GS1 Kenya, Mr. Peter Jeno, and he shared some incredible insights on traceability. And honestly, I hope you found this conversation as inspiring and informative as I did. Until we meet again, I'm your host, Miriam Munyoki. And remember, we trace it, you trust it.
Traceability TV. We trace it, you trust it.